Hello and welcome to Strange Stories. It's great to have you here. We are all about sharing stories of near-death experiences from around the world in the hopes of bringing some light and inspiration to your day. Our daily videos offer a glimpse into what lies beyond this life, and we believe that they can help us all appreciate the gift of life a little bit more. If you enjoy our content, please consider liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification bell to stay up to date on all of our latest videos. Your support means the world to us and helps us continue to grow. And to our returning viewers, welcome back. We're thrilled to have you with us again. So go ahead, grab a cozy blanket, get comfy, and join us for today's incredible near-death experience story. I had just turned 21 months prior. Valentine's Day 1998 was approaching. My university was six hours away. I awoke to a cloudy sky over Indiana that February morning. To put it mildly, those winters were difficult because of the literal darkness of both day and night. Valentine's Day was also approaching. As a single and singularly confused young man, the darkness did nothing to alleviate the depression of emotional and spiritual isolation that was already slicing through me like a jagged knife. I was studying philosophy at the time. After rejecting Catholicism two years earlier, I spent a lot of time arguing with Christians about the premises of their beliefs and the lack of logic that was used. I was enamored with rationalism and enticed by necessity and order. I was living in an apartment with another person at the time. After a particularly heated argument, I went to stay with some of my younger friends who shared a dormitory that evening. I joined them while they were drinking and listening to music. I battled depression for a long time, which was exacerbated by problematic romantic relationships. I made the decision to drown my sorrows. I chased a friend down the top floor's corridor. Each floor had two doors that opened from the center and always faced outward. There was a cross railing on the side of the top floor stairwell, and the stairs began to descend on the other. I was moving at top speed when I ran through the right side door to the stairs. I intended to descend the stairs. When I tripped, I found myself on the wrong side of the door as my body collided with it. As the stairs descended on the left side, I tripped and fell into the cross railing. When my body precisely hit the railing at my waist, my upper torso leaped over the railing and down the 10 feet of concrete stairs to the ground below. My body completed a full rotation before slamming into the edge of one of the stairs with increased centripetal speed and force. Reality vanished when I slammed into the cross rail. This serves as a watershed moment in my near-death experience. There was no pain, only cold and darkness. My awareness was the only thing I was certain of. I'm talking about a strong awareness that transcends feelings. I was simply aware without giving it any thought. The experience was anything but Cartesian. I didn't have to explain it because I was already aware of it. Everything was shrouded in darkness like a thick, heavy black cloak. The next thing I remember is being in the hospital's intensive care unit. I remember seeing a large crowd gathered around my bed at the time. Because I went to a small university, I was well-known and well-liked by many people. My sister was among them. The pastor of the university chapel was present. A few of my closest friends were present. My uncle and aunt were present. We had face-to-face -face conversations. Because I wasn't in pain, I found it upsetting to see their anguish. I recall trying to communicate with them, letting them know that I was not in pain, but that I was feeling better than I had in a long time. At this point, I felt an emotion that I can't put into words. I was liberated from all of the anxiety and emotional burden I had accumulated over the course of my life, as well as the suffering and annoyance caused by the physical and social worlds. I felt complete and limitless freedom. I thought I could move faster than the speed of light. There was no three-dimensional or physical movement. My mind appeared to be moving me rather than my body. All that existed was pure will. Other, more significant differences existed in this new reality. I had the impression that my perspective on life's meaning had shifted. I realized that the smallest irrational disagreements that people have with one another, as well as the resentments that ensue, are the most painful aspects of life. When there is an excessive attachment to the material world, the soul suffers and is damaged. Human life is in fact breathtakingly beautiful. Others would not choose a way of life that harms people, animals, and their local and global environments if they could see, feel, and experience this beauty. I was engulfed in a profound love at that precise moment. 
a love that I could feel coming from my friends and family. I felt the depth of human love encircling and refreshing me. There was light present throughout, but it was not light that followed conventional physics laws. The light comes from people, but there's no obvious source. Despite seeing their faces and grieving, I tried to console them by telling them that I was better than I'd ever been. There was one stab in my heart though. I assumed that I'd never met my soulmate in my physical form. This was the only gap in my persona. This aspect of myself rendered my life as a human insufficient. I realized that I'd been lying to myself for a long time about what would actually make me happy in terms of a deep romantic relationship. I wished I'd had the courage to fully share my soul with someone else. The situation for awake humans was dire. When my head slammed into the edge of the concrete step, I suffered multiple facial fractures. My sinuses and eye sockets were broken, beginning at the top of my jaw and progressing upward. My skull had fractured at the brow. Between my skull and my brain, the dura layer, which protects my brain from bacteria, was ripped. My father claimed that my eye sockets were nearly the size of a baseball. I lost four pints of blood. Severe swelling pinched and blocked my nerves. I couldn't see anything. However, in my human reality, that was by far the least of my concerns. I'm not sure why I remember seeing everyone's faces at my bedside. Neither did my desire to alleviate the pain I saw and felt in each and every one of those people. To swell like a sponge in the face of pain, to consume the pain and swallow it for the sake of the bereaved. It was difficult for me because I felt like I was finally free of the physical which had been the most enjoyable experience of my life to that point, and I had a better grasp on it. The people around me, on the other hand, found it to be the most terrifying. This is one of the universe's most intense paradoxes. I still remember the Learjet that flew me from Valparaiso to Cleveland. After being unloaded at Burke Lakefront Airport, I was rushed to the Cleveland Clinic. I can still see the clinic's intensive care unit's bright lights from when I was there. I can still see my parents, who were a little disheveled and withered at the time. When I was in this location, I had the impression that I was in a large movie theater. The screen quality was superior to digital resolution. Through this screen, I began to perceive the world of people. I was alone in the theater, despite how comfortable it was. It was comfortable, fascinating, and safe. I still remember my mother hand-washing the blood-stained jeans and t-shirt I was wearing when I fell. I relived my entire life while witnessing the reality of Earth and the human world in real time. I appear to be aware of every event in my life at the same time. The linear progression of my life accelerated into a single time-defying, brilliant shining point. My preconceived notions about time had been called into question. That idea actually stopped making sense because I assumed everything happened all at once and simultaneously. I recall being taken to surgery on the third day after starting my journey. I left my parents with the firm belief that I would never see them again. As I was brought into the operating room and placed on the operating table, I first noticed light all around me. There were no numbers or forms, only a warm, intense white light. I finally came to terms with the fact that I would eventually leave my physical body behind. I had no qualms about abandoning my physical body. For example, I was very interested in what would happen next. As soon as I let go of my body, I felt surrounded by an infinite love that was unaffected by materialism or restrictions. I felt as if I were in the palm of a huge protective hand, elevated above the agonizing and crippling finitude of my earthly body. The next thing I knew, I was at what I thought was an ancient Greek dinner party. I was the guest of an elderly man in his 60s. I realized that the dinner was being held in my honor. We were in a large white stone building with many large fruit-filled bowls scattered about. Other men were present, the majority of whom were in their mid to late 30s. Each of the men wore a sash in either deep blue, gold, or purple, and we were all dressed in white tunics. I recall the hostess being a deep blue color. We were all dipping our glasses into the wine-filled urns and savoring the sweet euphoric nectar. The men were conversing and amusing themselves on a dais near a side entrance to the hall. There was definitely a welcoming and friendly atmosphere. When the fruit bowls or the wine ran low, the older gentleman would summon his servants, who were teenage boys. The roasted lamb that the servants eventually brought out on trace was devoured by all. The party lasted all night and into the morning, 
and when it was time to go, I went out the back door. That was the end of my near-death experience. Two days after undergoing frontal brain surgery and facial reconstruction, I woke up in my hospital room. I was only in the hospital for two weeks before I was discharged. After that, I never again used pain medication. My brain and plastic surgeons told me after our final consultations that my case had outperformed expectations. They both told me separately that the isolated injuries to my face and top of my head and the speed with which I recovered were miracles. They both told me separately that the isolated injuries to my face and top of my head and the speed with which I recovered were miracles. Both of them claimed that they'd never witnessed a fall like mine result in such confined wounds and a speedy recovery. They claimed that only 1% to 3% of patients recover completely like I did.